your time here. Yeah. But now, finally, we are uh, ready to move on uh, to the um, uh, Lipid Finder presentation, which will be given by uh, your Alvarez Zareta. I'm sorry if I made the name wrong. So are you here? Are you yeah, um, the way it's going to work, Maria, is I'm going to start. Oh. We're going to do this okay. together, actually. So I'm going to do the first few slides to talk about what the tool is and how it works and how we came to generate it. And then Jorge is going to take over with a, um, a demo. So that right. we just get slides up. Yep, yeah, yeah. I'm going to try to attempt a live demo. <laughs> a live Isn't demo, it? yeah. So we, I'm trying to get it so that you can see the right screen. Do you have the full screen? Now? Yes, no, now it is, now it is. Okay. Yes. okay, so I mean, this is a tool which we set up, we started developing probably about eight, nine years ago for a very specific purpose, one specific purpose, just to see if we could get this to work. And we are particularly interested in my lab in, um, at that time, this was, I guess, 2015, 2014, thinking about how we could use high resolution LCMS to uh, approach lipid discovery and also, I guess, moving further on, this I think is a very helpful approach for improving statistical power when you want to clean up your data enough to get rid of spurious signals. So at the point when we started this, it was about cleaning up data sets because we've, we acquired a high resolution instrument like many people were doing around 2014 and, and we ran a long chromatography run. This is, this is a typical example of a data set we would have got at that time. 50 minute uh, reverse phase HPLC run uh, zero, 100 to 900 mass units and you know if you're doing three scans a second on an orbit trap at high resolution this is the kind of thing you get you know maybe 60,000 features showing up and it, and the majority about 90 95 percent of this is junk and you just have to clean it up so I think it's fine if you've got to find mass lists and you know the retention times and you know what you're looking for but when you don't and when you want to clean it up get rid of junk and look for new things you have to have ways to do that that really think about what are the artifacts and how do you remove them so at the time, there were a number of solutions around which were starting to be developed, but they were in early stage as well. So XCMS, Progenesis, MZ Mine, Civ, and a few other things. And we tried a few of these. And because it was so long ago, none of these were really tailored for lipid data. They were more metabolomics, and they were also in early stage development. So we decided we would develop our own solution for this. And uh, let me get the slides to move. Always a challenge when you've got big things going on. Oh, there we go. Then it goes too far, doesn't it? Uh, come back. So it's gone on to, yeah. oh, this is typical, isn't it? Sorry about this. Okay, now I've touched it twice, so it should in its own time get to the right slide, I think. It seems like there is some delay. Uh, yeah, I know. I think it's, it's it, you know, sometimes, there we go. Sometimes what it is with PowerPoint is with these figures that have loads of data points in them, this, the file gets very big and then it gets quite slow. So anyway, um, so the first one on the left there is just an example of, of the first version of Lipid Finder, which was published in 2019 as an application note. Actually, we published a paper before that showing its, its use, but this was um, it's showing with the first version how we could achieve removal of a lot of junk in those kinds of data sets. There's still a lot there, um, but it was clearly large, you know, hugely improved from 60,000 as, as we saw. And this, um, working with, with Owen and with Chris Brasher and Jorge and a number of others, um, we got it to the point where we could clean up the data to the extent that I'm showing on the right. And because this is MS data, I don't feel comfortable giving these lipids names at all. I think as far as we've gone with this tool is to annotate to putative categories of lipids because remember this is just MS there's no MS MS in this analysis with this tool so we we annotate them to putative um, categories because that then means we can look statistically at the behavior of different categories on their own so we know like we discussed earlier in the week when when lipids change due to metabolic changes in tissues they tend to change in groups they don't change with like one PC and none of the other PCs change, they will tend to either go up as a group or down as a group. So the reasoning behind this was that if we annotate them to putative categories, we can then do statistics on those categories and look for patterns and see what's changing. So the modules in version one, which was published in this paper here in 2017 are all listed here. And we don't wanna go into this in too much detail other than just to outline kind of on the left, that the main sort of module, um, you know, we at this point back then were using data which was being run through XCMS first and then running through Lipid Finder because by 2017 XCMS was doing a, a much better job and 
but we still had issues with things like you know isotope um, removal and other other lots of common contaminant ions we wanted to get rid of so so we would go through XCMS and then we would put it into peak filter optimizer and then peak filter modules and that lists the number of steps that we had that we would put the data through to clean it up like removing contaminants um, correcting for outliers, sample retention time corrections across multiple samples, etc. So it, it was like on top of XCMS, this is just another way to improve your data before you look at it. Um, so that was the first version and the optimizer module is listed on the right. And again, in that paper, there's a big supplementary section which goes through each of those modules, how they work, what the algorithms are, how they work and what they remove. And also gives references because for, for example, contaminant removal or various other um, common ions that are contaminants of electrospray contamination. There are papers on this and we essentially took lists of masses from those papers that describe electrospray contaminants and plug them in so that they could be removed. So if people want to get information on the kinds of things that are removed, it's all in the supplementary to that paper. Um, and then this is just examples of what, what Chris Brasher did. I mean, I think on the bottom right, left, you can kind of see that we're, you know, you have to identify peaks in this data based on criteria such as retention time tolerance ranges, intensity tolerance ranges, mass to charge tolerance ranges. And when you think about the complexity of this kind of MS data across this sort of mass range and this sort of retention time, peaks are not uniform. They vary a lot in terms of width, height, um, resolution, et cetera. And really, you know, this is, so there's, so there's a lot of caveats to this approach. I think when you when you use this, you've got to really think about going back and checking where you see differences. You really want to go back and check your data, check your peaks, make sure that they are good peaks. They look real um, because this kinds of software tools, all of them will pick out stuff and create stuff and amalgamate peaks in ways that's kind of unexpected. So sanity checking data, in, especially when you find differences, I think is really important to stress with, with this kinds of approaches. So how did this compare to other programs back a few years ago? So say around 2017, we ran a comparison with, so peak filter on the left is lipid finder compared with XCMS on its own or MZ minor progenesis. Here, we're not running it after XCMS, we're just running it on its own. And you can see each of these programs gives very different outputs. For example, MZ mine in the middle there has got loads of these kind of horizontal um, lines of ions that just haven't been removed and that's just a sign up a sign of bad cleanup as far as as we would say so so they're all very different and they all perform differently but we really want to try and get it so that it retains the best number of lipid like ions as possible so that we can then go hunting for new things so in in, a, in another paper we showed also the impact of the stepwise cleanup so the different modules of lipid finder on the top left you've got post sieve as the first step um, and then after solvent removal, background correction, feature finding, et cetera, each time stepwise, the black ones are the ones that are removed after each step. So you go from the top left to the bottom right, and you've essentially got a far cleaner data set um, where a lot more of these, uh, you, know, can that, you know, when you get to this point, you can then start thinking about putting it through databases to see what's there. One of the things we did with this was to clean up data from platelets which had been activated with thrombin versus platelets that were not activated with thrombin and when we then looked at individual lipids that remained or that were significantly different on thrombin activation a load of putative phospholipids so green being the color we assigned to phospholipids turned up they all uh, elude early too early for native phospholipids and they all turned out to be oxidized phospholipids so this cleanup approach allowed us to discover a lot of uh, potential or actual that we then went on to validate these as actual oxidized phospholipids that really are generated when platelets get activated. So it's quite useful for this kind of approach where you want to subtract data from different sample sets and look at what's different and then try and identify new lipids. Of course, as I said, you have to back all of this up with MSMS. So any of the lipids we've reported with this approach, we have done that. And this is in one of the papers where we showed uh, icosanoids attached to phosphonositides. So it's heat PIs. Um, also, you know, found using this approach and there's MSMS done and, and chromatography. The Orbitrap peaks are not great, but um, peaks from then the subsequent MRM runs are absolutely fine and we've got nice MSMS um, and we also have high resolution MSMS. So you, you really need to validate anything you do with this. So we've then gone on and we've put an interface on lipid maps and I think Jorge is going to describe that in his tutorial part here. Um, this interface is now the version two of Lipid Finder, which we're going to talk about. Um, it is open source Python workflow. There's a GitHub version that people can download and adapt and do what they want with. And there's the up to date version on Lipid Maps, which um, then has the advantage that oops, it links with statistical tools that Owen Fahey has put on and also that you can do MS searching and classify your lipids into different categories. 
obviously with the searching, we feel strongly this needs to be done using the bulk search only. And I also would suggest you stick to searching and annotating based on categories. Be very careful about anything going further than categories with this approach. Um, and obviously then anything you find that's different, you have to validate. So, but at this point you can statistically analyze because you can you can put them into groups. You know, are the phospholipids behaving differently across cohorts or are the, the uh, putative phospholipids or are the glycerides or are the sphingolipids or whatever has been annotated. So, you know, it's a screening approach. Is, is what we want to stress. So um, Lipid Finder 2 has got several new modules which are listed here. There's an in-source fragment removal module. Now I know XCMS also does in-source fragment removal, but they are different, quite different algorithms. They work in different ways. And we found it quite helpful to use the XCMS in-source removal one and then go come to Lipid Finder and do the same because you improve even more if you do it twice with two different approaches. And then we've got isotope removal, salt cluster removal, and a false discovery rate module, which has kind of only really been beta tested with one or two data sets so far. So we're interested if other people use it to see how they get on with this. And then also Jorge put in a, a colorblind friendly palette as well that people can choose. And then this is the kind of data that we get from it nowadays uh, with version two that, that he's gonna talk through. And just to show the improvement in cleanup, this is a data set from macrophages. I think this was raw macrophages cleaned up by XCMS. I think this is positive and negative mode here. Um, uh, if we clean up with XCMS first, we've got this with the Orbitrap 2 settings, which are generic Orbitrap settings for Orbitrap data. And then if we follow this with, with Lipid Finder version 1, it goes from this to this. If we follow this with Lipid Finder 2, we get this much more cleaned up data here. So this is what we're really looking at, yeah, negative and positive data. So it, it shows how using the two programs together can really help with cleaning up this you know, massive kind of, uh, you know, huge amount of, of data that you really want to get rid of most of. There's also an API interface so that you can use XCMS and then uh, Lipid Maps. You can fetch the uh, data from um, XCMS online and move it across into uh, Lipid Finder. So it's kind of streamlines the inter interface between these two programs if you want to use one after another. So on Lipid Maps, uh, user-friendly interface, Jorge is going to show you links to the database so you can search and you can also do statistic anal analysis such as volcano plots like this, divided them into the different Lipid categories so that you can look at them separately. Um, and then we published an application note there. So Jorge is going to come in now and talk about a, um, do a, a tutorial. If we've got time at the end, I'll come back and show another bit of data on recent uses of this program. But otherwise, you know, we're more than happy to leave this as a, as a tutorial entirely and use up, use up all the time for that. So I need to stop sharing my screen so that Jorge can share his. Thank you, Val. I'm going to go. attend to share my desktop. Now, I hope you can see it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, you're gonna see me with the face looking at the other screen because it's bigger so I can show you more stuff. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse. I'm gonna attempt to do a live demo, which, you know, they usually say don't ever attend that because things tend to go bad, but well, let's see how it goes. Uh, so I, how to use Lipid Finder. So uh, I'm gonna follow, as you can see here, this is the updated image for Lipid for the Lipid Finder and Lipid Maps. You will see this on the Lipid Maps website, as I will show you in a minute, where you Lipid Finder, you get the test samples as well as explained already. You go through LCMS, then you pass it to a preprocessing tool, usually XCMS, but if you have your data preprocessed with another tool, Lipid Finder will also be able to handle that. Now, and then it will do some peak filtering uh, with all these stages that Paul has commented the new additions mainly. I will cover them a little bit more in a minute. And then do a MS searching with lipid classification, putative lipid classification, and you will get your results. Uh, additionally, for the standalone version, which I'm going to run on the terminal here in my computer, you have the amalgamation step. So you can combine both negative and positive results after peak filtering before the uh, MS searching, uh, but that's only available in the standalone version, so not in the Lipid Maps. And on the other hand, and if you reuse Lipid, uh, the Lipid Finder on Lipid Maps, you will have a set of statistical tools like Paul has mentioned. So without further ado, uh, first we're just going to start with the date, the input data. 
Uh, well, yeah, uh, first, well, first of all, sorry, uh, let's go about how to install Liquid Finder in your machine. So I have shared in the chat uh, two links, one for the GitHub repository for Liquid Finder and one for the Liquid Maps version. If you go into the Liquid Finder in the, into GitHub, you will see that there's a lot of explanation, a quite thorough manual on how to, what Liquid Finder is meant to do, how to install it, how to configure it, and so on and so forth. Here on the right side, you can see there is the latest release is the version 2.02. .02. And if you go there, you can download this, the will file. And if you have, if you are use a user of Python, it's as easy as you keep install and then uh, sorry, the lipid finder thing. I won't do it because I have done it already, but if you want to do it, just press enter and it will install all the dependencies and uh, lipid finder will be ready for you. If you are using Linux or Mac, then all the modules are available with run underscore. As you can see there, you have a MS search and big filter. If you use on Windows, the same links will be there, but we have the .pi. That's a specific kind of specific thing that only happens in on Windows. Uh, once this is done, then we need to focus first, obviously, in our input data. So as uh, we have explained, um, Lipid, find, Lipid, uh, Lipid Finder can handle different input formats now, uh, from Excel files to CSV to TSV and other formats. We are mainly obviously focused on the XMS output because that's what usually people use, but that doesn't mean we don't accept other type of other formats. So for instance, in Lipid Finder and Lipid Maps, when we go to the first step, which is the load the data, we have a sample, uh, both the local installation and the Lipid Maps version have a sample of macrophages that you can choose from negative or positive. Uh, there we'll have also a loaded configuration files and everything will be ready for you just to run it, to give it a, a feeling of how to use Lipid Finder. Uh, for this case, you can also on Lipid Finder and Lipid Maps upload a file. So you can click on choose a file and then uh, you can come over to the tutorial and then load, for instance, this tiny example I have prepared here. And once you load it, it will ask you for certain parameters that I will cover in a minute. Or you can also choose to load data for, directly from XEMS. How does, how does this work? Well, if you go to XEMS online and you have your account, you will have some results, some uh, processing data you may have already. So you have to pass your, your username, which is really your, most likely your email address and then the job ID here, and you will put it here and also fill in the extra additional information and you can load the results directly from XMS. Since the, those XMS results I'm showing you are quite big, I will focus only on the uh, tiny example I have here. And um, as you can see that file, uh, it's here and it's, it's, it's a, smaller set data set from the negative COVID samples just to show you a little bit how it looks like and the most important thing you need to know from these files is what's the name of the mass uh, MZ column which in this case is MZ med yeah, that's how it usually goes in uh, XCMS the retention time and the, the units of the retention time in this in this case there are minutes and then the number of the column where we get the first data. So in this case, we have number 23. Furthermore, in our in this example, we have three samples. So it's one technical repli replicate with three technical, sorry, one sample replicate of one sample with three technical replicates, that's it. And then we have three uh, solvents here, and that's all the information we need. With all this information, we go to here and we start filling in the configuration on this step. You can say negative, and we have one sample, we have three technical replicates, sealed quality control data, uh, yeah, the columns, three solvent replicates, and the first index is the 23rd, MZ med. RT med and the retention time is in minutes. And then we will click load and it will load. Here you can say it has been successfully uploaded. 
and you can see again here the values you have set on your configuration just to make sure everything works perfectly fine. How do you do this locally? Well, uh, as you can see here, we have uh, the negative data, the same negative data, and then we have a folder here called params. Just to give you an idea of what's in here, here are the parameters for uh, Lipid Finder written in this way. This might be a little bit tedious, or I mean, you need a little level of expertise to know what to change here and what not to change, but as you can see here, mainly we have the same polarity uh, preposition software, if it's XMS or other, the number of samples, technical replicates. So the similar values you have introduced before, and then what we want to run. I will show you where these options are in the maps in a minute, but just to give you an idea, of, we are activating all the uh, optional modules, but the full discovery rate for the sake of time in, in this uh, demo, but you could also obviously activate it as well. And for the positive, the only change is that the polarity is positive. Just to say that the default values of all the other parameters that I will show you, there are a lot of parameters, can be, uh, can be left as, as they are because they are usually ready for most data sets. Unless you know what you're doing and you want to tune them, I would suggest you to leave them as they are, at least at the beginning when you start working with your data. But once you become familiar with DB Finder, feel free to edit them as, as you feel like. So uh, since this might be a little bit troublesome, especially for people that are less used to the handle of these kind of files, we have a couple of options for Lipid Finder. Uh, you can configure the parameters. And by the way, every um, method that is available in Lipid Finder has uh, an option to help that will tell you what the, this algorithm is for, how to use it, and what each one of the uh, arguments is for. And in this case, we can say like, oh, we can we want to configure the parameters for a uh, peak filter, uh, sorry, minus M, peak filter, and you can use uh, previous parameters files, you have it, in this case, we won't use a one, just to show you how it works, and you press enter, and it will start question, asking you questions for each one of the parameters, and you can start choosing, like, positive, or any one, sorry, in this case, it was for the negative file, and, well, it's a little bit, um, you have to be, you have to, you can only give the options that it shows you. You cannot, it's not case, it's case sensitive. So it might take you a little bit, a little bit to get used to it, but anyway. And once you finish at the end, it will save the file, whatever you want. If you are more in uh, in likes of something with um, an interface, like it will be online, there is also a, a, an option with a Jupyter notebook. So you can, uh, in the Bitfinder on GitHub, you can, in the documents folder, there is a Jupyter Notebook, which is this, that provides you with the same manual you have seen before. But in this case, the code shown here, it's uh, all, you can execute it. As you can see here, you could press and start uh, running all these modules. And in this case, I'm gonna use this to show you the interface. There's an interface that only works in, uh, in the Jupyter Notebooks mainly, that you can use, and for instance, for the module uh, MS Search, you can run this and it will show you the same interface. Uh, if I make this big enough, you will see that you have all the options with all the parameters you can choose from on for MS Search. And then at the end, you can say like where you want to save it and it will save it and that's about it. Okay, going back to both uh, this places the additional configuration of Lipid Finder and of Peak Filter in Lipid Maps. It's down here. If you click on selection, you will see all the different parameters there to choose. Uh, this is an interactive uh, setting. So if you click no here, for instance, if you don't want to remove contaminants, it will shrink all the information and so on and so forth with all the related parameters regarding each module, which you can see here on the left side. If you don't know what a parameter does, there is always this option to say, well, this value must, must be greater than zero or whatever information you might need about it. Like it's in minutes or, yeah. They are to, the help text has been tried to make it self-explanatory. So you know exactly what you are setting up. But as I said, in most cases, you can leave them as they are and it will work. The only thing that I've seen 
many people when I work uh, in Cardiff University to change was the summary where instead of 0, 60 people you use random uh, values between 1 and 57 or something like that. But besides that, we can leave everything as it is. We can click on Run Lipid Finder and it will start running. A new tab will, be, will open and you can see here Lipid Finder is running. If something goes wrong, it will tell you it's not working. How to do the same here in, on the terminal then? You can, you can run the pick filter. We can ask for help if we don't know exactly how it works. And then we say, well, we have our input file, which is the negative. We can, uh, the parameters file, which is in the parameters file. And then we can say like, oh, we, I want the results in the pick filter negative folder that it will create for us. And if we want, to know how it has been deleted, each, each module has deleted uh, the data or how much data has been deleted on each step, we can uh, ask for the verbose option and it will give you all the detailed step-by-step -step results. So in this case, we can click on enter and you can see there, you will see a progress bar. So you are not just blindly running a, a script. You will see how it's progressing. And now uh, we have to wait a little bit to see how this goes. Should be quite fast. Uh, there might be minor changes on performance, obviously, because server, uh, the, although the software is doing exactly the same, obviously the implementation for the server usually tends to involve other stuff that are, it's running the server at the moment, or it's locally, it's on your computer and, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, obviously the server uh, it's usually more stable because it's check and con uh, but it's working all the time. Let's see which one finished first. Going back a little bit of peak filter and its para and its parameters. As you can see here, there are many modules, but only a few, uh, as I have shown you in the configuration file, are to set it true or false. Some others might might or might not run depending on whether you use XMS or other preprocessing tool because. Some of the steps uh, that were designed on Liquid Finder are already covered by XCMS. For instance, the Peak Finder and the feature analysis, those two are already done by XCMS, so we don't do them again on Liquid Finder. Let's see if they are finishing. There we go. So as you can see here, the one both have finished at the same time, so that's great. Great timing. So as you can see here on the Liquid Map side, you will be able to download the parameters and download the output data. Um, but in this case, we are going to download it, but it will download a CSV file. And then we can do the MS search over this input data. On the terminal, I'm going to run the same for the positive. Uh, on the meantime, because we need it for the, for the amalgamation. Uh, but in the meantime, I can cover, I can go ahead and cover part of the MS search well, part. We could, we could just search on one of them, Jorge, and not bother with this amalgamation step. We could leave that because more recently we haven't done that anyway. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's there. So I can, I I can show you. I, it's, just, not, it's not going to take long anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's one, it's another one which some people might find useful, but other people might not like that approach anyway. It's where we combine positive and negative data sets, taking into account the changes in mass between lipids that ionize in both modes. You know, we try and clean it up like this, but it's, yeah, I think the last experiments we've done, we haven't used it. We've looked at positive and negative separately. So I think people, so long as people know they can try that if they want, but it's an option, I guess, to download already as positive or negative and do LMSD bulk searches, isn't it? Yeah. Literally anyway, so, yeah. So yeah, I mean, going to the MS search. Yeah. yeah, that's just to do LMSD bulk search. Yes, yeah. so you have the bulk search as Val has said, and in this case, you can choose between two databases, the computational generated database and the complete lipid mass structure database. Yeah, I mean, or I, and I recommend LMSD in general, just because yeah. you have more meaningful, likely. Yeah, I was, I was about to say that, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, overall, yeah, use, I, I would recommend that you use the LMSD as the one that's giving the best results, but. You know, you always have the option just in case, and you are interested in something more computationally generated. You can choose the mass tolerance. As you can see, there's a lot of range of mass tolerance. It is based on the delta uh, from the mass. You can select 
the ions you want. Like in this case, we can select all if you want to results and we can sort the results by whatever you want in Delta, for instance. And uh, if you want to search for a specific category, just click on the categories you want. If you want them all, just don't click any and it will just do it for you and it will return all the categories. Uh, by the way, if you want to come back to your work, there's always pro a link provided with your ID that if you go back to it, it will uh, tell you what step you want to go back if you haven't run all the steps through yet, or if you want to close the running screen that I have shown you before. So you can always come back to your work or start a new analysis where everything you have computed before will be deleted. So be sure that you have downloaded everything you want before doing that. Now you can, you can click on run MS search. And another tab will be will open with the MS search. Telling you that's running, so that's great. On the meantime, since we have some spare time, I'm going to show you how to run the amalgamator. So for the amalgamator, you can use uh, sorry. So the results. I'm going to show you. The results are here in this folder, and you can see we will have a, lo a log file where it's telling you every step of what's been doing and how many uh, element uh, rows have it, it has deleted on each step. The whole data CSV file that will contain not only uh, it will contain also all the columns that were there before in your data, so it will preserve all the information that was there before. And the summary will remove everything and leave only the mass, the retention time, and the uh, information about the the intensities um, and so on and so forth. That's all the information we'll keep. And as I have said, in a uh, sorry, I'm gonna use this other option instead. And as you can see here, you have a file for each one of the steps on, on down the line that it has been doing. Big filter has done. So you can check on the results what's going on and see if something that you didn't want to be deleted has been deleted or yeah. So for the amalgamator, I, I see that. And then the results on PS, uh, MS search is already, but I can do it quickly. So you can, again, uh, no. There you go. And then, as you can see here, it's asking for a negative file. So we can see, like, we want the complete. Uh, File, the same for the positive one. And then we have the parameters already prepared. Uh, I will show you in a minute. Um, and then you can say, like, oh, I want the results in the amalgamator file uh, folder. I can run it. And in this case, as you can see, there is an error because so I just wanted to show you this that. If, you, if the, all the columns in both files are not exactly the same because uh, something was not uh, working as expected, it will show you what the columns are. So you should go to those files, fix the issue, and then do the amalgamation. I will provide you with a single file with uh, telling you the, the, the polarity of each one of the rows in your data. For, uh, then after that, you can run MS search here. Um, I'm going to run MS search on, again, on the negative file, for instance, and then, then from the pick filter already. And then and I, I can use the summary. Why not? And then you can say, okay, I'm going to save it on MS search and the parameters file is going to be parameters um, MS search LMSD. And because we are using only the negative side. You can run it and another progress bar will be shown and it will keep searching for on for an LMSD database, all the information from the peak filter negative summary. Just to show you a little bit of the contents of these two JSON files, as you can see here, it's as simple as you have only one sample with three technical replicates, but the end you end up with only one sample. The two columns on the first index, index of the first column, and the, if you want to combine the densities when it find, finds the same uh, element in both positive and negative files. This is for the amalgamator, and for MS search, 
assuming uh, you have mass retention then again for the columns, you say that you want the LMSD database, the mass tolerance, in this case we have chosen 0 0.05 Daltons, uh, you want, we want to add all the columns, we want a summary as well, and then uh, an option we can do on LibreFinder locally is to plot the categories, choose the file format we want, and if we want the standard version of the colorblind, colorblind friendly version of the plot. Let's go back to the terminal, this is almost done. And as you can see here on lipid maps, you will have again the parameter JSON file in case you want to run this same setup on, uh, on your local machine. The CSV file with the results, the CSV file with the retention tunnel measurements, or you have the last one, which is an enhanced online view of the results. You click on here, you will go to a table where all the file will be dis displayed with a lot of additional information. Where you have for each input mass, all the matches, uh, the names, the putative names. Again, this is, as Val said, most likely you will want to focus only on the class and which ions and the formula. And if you click in one of these links, it will go to the specific uh, information for that lipid. In this case, because we have only one sample with three technical replicates, we cannot run the uh, statistical analysis on the results. But for the sake of showing you this, I have run the macrophages dataset before, where we can show you that you can assign sample groups for each one of the sets of the, of the, of the data. In this case, we have six samples for raw and six samples for peritoneal macrophages. So we assign them the sample group. So all of them are together, grouped together. You assign the factors. And then you will be offered four different uh, statistical analyses where you can choose different options depending on which one you select. And for instance, for the volcano plot, you can choose raw versus peritoneal with a fold change of 1.5 and a p-value threshold of 0 0.05. You click on run, another tab will open. And then you will get the volcano plot and the uh, all the information that you want on the table that of the data displayed there that you can download. Uh, and if you want also, you can go back and run a merge search only on the volcano plot hits. So it's, it's giving you options to simplify the steps. On the local version of, of Lipid Finder for MS search, if you go to the um, MS search file folder, you will see that we have the category scatter plot. Uh, Image, uh, we have the summary of an XML file, the MS, all the, the, the non summary version, and the log again, because there's always a log to track what's going on. And I'm going to open one second the tutorial and MS search and to show you. So this is the category scatter plot of the data at the end, as you can see with colors assigned to each one of the categories and some unknowns. And for the XML file, it resembles the enhanced version I have shown you on XCMS, on, on, uh, sorry, on Lipid Finder Online with the retention time, the match mass, the delta BPA, the retention time, the polarity, the delta, the bulk structure, name, formula, adduct, class, main class category, and you also have links to each one, uh, to examples uh, of each one of the matches here. And also it will show you the ID of the row, the ID of this mass, and this the intensity on the mean on that sample. Um, that's about it. Uh, I don't know if we have more time, so I will- I'll come back very quickly. Yeah, I got another three slides I can show very quickly. And I've been, yeah. taking, there's been a question in the chat, I've been taking it as we went along. So I think, um, you know, this this was well done, Jorge. The, I think to get that work working live was was really good. So let me get this, uh, where is it again? It's this one, I believe. Okay, am I showing, I'm showing the right one, yeah? Okay, so very quickly, just at the end to kind of cover a, a recent use case with this. So. Um, this is uh, about 30, a cohort of about 50 or 60 samples of which half of them are 
people with normal risk of cardiovascular disease and the other group are people with an elevated risk based on a SNP that they have in a particular chromosome 9p21 locus. It's a common cause of cardiovascular disease. It's not associated with known changes in lipoprotein lipids, for example. So kind of a, a known inflammatory cause of vascular disease. So we were, we had a collaboration with a group in London and we wanted to see whether using this method we could uncover any changes in lipids in plasma from these people. So um, the lipids, for, so as I said, it was about 30 from each, 25 to 30 from each group from the risk SNP or the non-risk SNP. Um, lipids extracted, analyzed and run using uh, a reverse phase column and um, you know, with the, on the orbit trap doing M LCMS. Um, data all went through XCMS first, and this is what it looked like, and then through Lipid Finder, allowing us to annotate to putative phospholipids or glycerolipids or fatty acyls or whatever. And I think what, what, I, what was really useful about this was that by being able to segregate it into the individual lipid categories and then look at do statistics on them separately, this greatly increased the statistical power of what we were able to do because if you're familiar with doing statistics on like omic approaches, big data omic approaches, you know about the, the problem with multiple comparison testing. So the larger the number of variables, the more difficult it is to find significance in your p-values. You've got to get much lower p-values to be significant because of the issue uh, with false positives. So by grouping them by phospholipids or fatty acids or whatever, we can really help with this. And also because the two the programs using XCMS followed by Lipid Finder, it tries really hard to remove all of the spurious stuff, including things like in-source fragments, which may contribute to putative matches in many of these cases. It reduces the number of variables as much as, as possible, which also helps increase statistical power. So in this case, when we looked at the different individual categories, what you can see straight away is that for the risk versus the non-risk SNP, glycerolipids aren't really moving up or down in terms of fold change or in terms of p-value. And that's, you know, using standard volcano plot, plot approach. The one that really did look like it was moving or changing in response to the SNP was this one, which is glycerophospholipids. There's a group here that are, it's not a huge decrease, but it's significant, it's highly significant. And when we looked at the masses of these, they all turned out to be masses that were consistent with lysophospholipids. All the lines of phospholipids were up here, with all the other phospholipids down here. So that allowed us to make a hypothesis as to, you know, are lines of phospholipids different in this group of people who have elevated cardiovascular risk? And we found that we then straight away went to full validation using targeted lipidomics, which we repeated in the same samples that we did the untargeted. And then we got extra cohort samples, which we did a more targeted analysis with too. So we did two separate cohort groups for this, combined them. And you can see that as we saw with the untargeted, there is, it's not a huge difference, but it's a highly significant decrease in the risk group. So we were able to completely validate this with targeted lipidomics and show then specifically which species were different. You know, it's not just lysophospholipids, it's these particular ones. And we then went back and, you know, using the, the orbit trap and the untargeted approach, we pulled out putative lysophospholipid matches in a number of other risk SNPs and showed that, well, they don't really show anything in terms of, you know, being high, any fold change differences or in significance. These ones here all belong to the chromosome 9p21 SNP, showing that it seems to be something that's really unique to that um, uh, risk SNP in terms of cardiovascular risk. So that's just an illustration of how, the, how we've used this approach in a non-hypothesis generating way. But I always consider it like a kind of old style affymetrics array where you have to validate everything you do. Um, one way to improve this is to combine it instead with reverse phase, which what we did, to use helic chromatography. Um, this was a suggestion made recently, and I think it's a very good one. If we use helic chromatography, we oh, can we then- we don't hear your screen anymore. Was it the plan? Yeah, yeah, because I'm finished talking about that. So that's fine. I was gonna, so it's really just to say that helic chromatography will give a big improvement here because if there's in-source fragments still there um, that are coming out throughout the reverse phase uh, runs, if you use helic, you can then narrow down retention time windows where different phospholipid classes and sphingolipids and other lipids are coming off. And that seems to help, uh, you know, that will help for some of them. So and including internal standards to help annotate helic chromatography is, is possibly a good way to, to improve this. But nonetheless, it has in a number of cases allowed us to find new interesting things. But, you know, the, the caveat being that there will always be issues with these approaches and you just have to be careful to not over annotate, not use these methods and then name your lipids, um, be very suspicious of these things and go back and check and validate properly. So hopefully um, this will be useful for people and um, we're happy to take any questions that might come up. But I think I may have answered them already in the chat. So maybe not. Yeah, that was quite uh, intense discussion in the chart. 
So there are also some questions maybe for the people who are not so familiar with uh, many of these terms. So maybe uh, Jorge can just briefly explain about JSON file formats. There was a question about that as well. Sure, yeah, I mean, sorry, yeah, I missed that bit. Uh, so the JSON format, I think Sisu has, sorry, I hope I have pronounced that name well, uh, has kind of roughly explained on the chat, is just a text file uh, with some kind of structure. And the idea is that those files uh, help you to kind of put the information in a ordered way. And since there are text files, you can edit them anywhere in any machine, and there's, they are not dependent on anything like, for instance, XML files, uh, sorry, Excel, Excel files could because if your machine is not working or you're, you don't have a Excel file uh, reader, you won't be able to, to handle them. But in this case, they work in every machine uh, because you just need a text editor. Uh, I will strongly suggest not to edit these files unless you are familiar. And, uh, well, you're not familiar with this kind of software and use instead one of the APIs provided either on locally or on the apps. But yeah, I mean, they're always there. Oops, thank you. And Alpesh has a question. Would you like to ask it? Alpesh? Hi there, Val, and very nice presentation, actually. I just wanted to ask whether we could use this Lipid Finder software for data generated on low resolution instruments, you know, where we are just using semi-targeted approaches uh, like precursor and neutralis con, and we want to just get rid of any junk from those data sets. Can we use Liquid Finder for that? Well, I, I, I think in terms of identifying and categorizing signals, I wouldn't because the resolution would be high enough, but for getting rid of junk, possibly. But with a low resolution instrument, you, you wouldn't generally be doing Scan, you wouldn't be, oh, you mean if you're doing precursor scanning throughout a run and you get a load yeah. of junk? And, yeah, uh, we've never tried. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I, yeah, not, not sure. Might need some work to tailor the software to be able to do that, but I, I don't know. I have the impression that it will work in terms of whether it will work or not, it will work. Whether the results are significant or useful for you, that's another question completely. And yeah. Also, obviously, you will need a lot of tweaking of the parameters because as they are now, they are meant for uh, high resolution LCMS. Yeah, comment on the CompDB database. Yeah, I mean, uh, we recently put data through both and I looked at the CompDB database results and just bulk straight away because there was a huge amount of stuff coming up, Miguel, that wouldn't be um, expected at all in the kinds of samples that we were screening. Um, so. I think particularly for you know mammalian samples or you know ones where you know it's it's generally well known lipids that are that should be showing up you're, you're just better off to stick with LMSD really I mean it's it's yeah we were even with LMSD getting lots of lots of hits loads and loads of hits so I I think um, and in fact lots you get lots of hits of stuff that you really think shouldn't be there just because they're in LMSD and they, but they might be in other organisms too and so. Yeah, it, it's because it's got everything that's theoretical in there. There's so many things that just probably won't really be in your sample that, that will show up. So, yeah, I mean, if, if you have some data, it's the best thing is to put it through both and see the difference. I, I think you'll straight away put aside the CompDB output and go back to LMSD if you do that, though. I think we're done, Maria. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, no, there is still one more question. We can take the last one. Well, yeah. well, we haven't. I mean, the choice would be, so there would be Swiss lipids, but Swiss lipids is, is also huge. It's it's uh, like over a million hits of, you know, large amounts of computational um, derived lipids in there too. So, you know, I, I think if you really want to get it narrowed down to the most likely hits, then I would just stick with LMSD, which is 40,000, 43,000 already. And, uh, you know, you can just have a higher confidence in, in what you're finding. Um, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, then there's, I guess, you know, maybe you're thinking about Metlin, which Gary showed, which there he's obviously got, what, over a million or 800,000 real compounds now? You could someone remind me of the numbers. Uh, 800, eight, yeah, 800 something plus uh, standards. Yeah, yeah. Spectra. So, um, you know, those will all be real compounds there. Um, yeah, maybe, but we haven't. We haven't done that. On the programmatic side, I can tell you that uh, provided you have some kind of uh, intern, so 
Qubit Finder connects via a REST kind of service. So it's a URL that you provide and then it uses to link to Lipid Maps to gather the data and get it back. So probably you have something similar in any other database. You could, but you will have to do it. Uh, you will have to edit the code yourself. Yeah. Do not yeah, prepare to, to for that. Yeah, Jorge's right. I mean, you can take the output and you can search whatever database you want. That's right, isn't it, Jorge? The, the, the output file has got all of the, the mass to charge values in it, in your list. So you can, you should be able yeah, to- if, if you want to a search to do it for you, you can edit the software to do it again, but uh, you have to edit more stuff inside. Yeah. And, uh, you could actually do make MS search work for other databases, but that might need a little bit of tweaking and working on the code itself. Yeah. Not much, for the Sorry, can I ask one more question, please, before I, um, what for data that is generated on um, executive plus instrument where we don't have a quadruple in front. So, you know, we do get all fragment ions, basically, you know, MSE kind of fragments. Can we use lipid? Uh, finder to clear out data for those kind of data sets? Generated well, on yeah, I mean, it's really designed for MS, but I mean, if you put in whatever data you put in, it will try and clean it up using the algorithms that are there. So, so long as you have a good look at how it's cleaning up and how each module is performing, you can choose which to include and which not to include. And I think that's a matter for you to, to look at the code Think about your data, think about what you want to achieve and what you want to clean up, really. Um, you know, so we have really only applied it to MS data. There's no reason why it, it, it certainly, the code will have a go at cleaning up whatever it's given. And it is, as Jorge said, also now platform independent, right? Jorge, it'll take any input files, yeah. So you can you can try and see what happens, but you, I guess you just have to be thinking carefully about what, what it is you want out of the end of it. So yeah, maybe. Okay. Okay, great. Then uh, after all those nice presentations and uh, quite a good discussions, we are done for today, but tomorrow we'll follow more of presentation lectures and more tutorials. So have a good rest and we are waiting for all of you tomorrow online. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.